Father, I truly am glad that you're here. You are here. You're so real and so precious and so close. So glad that Jesus is here. That the Holy Spirit is here. That the saints of God are here. Not only those who may happen to be saints and are sitting in this hall, but the saints of God who are even now walking with you in white because you have made them worthy. I'm thankful that the angels are here inquiring into those things which are declared in the assemblies. Oh, Father, it's such a warm place here this morning. And the presence of those who are unseen by human eye is more real to us this morning than the presence of those we can see with human eye. And if for a moment the door to the fourth dimension could open <clears throat> and we could look around, how surprised we'd be to see that every one of these empty seats is occupied. And the room is literally bulging with the presence of of yourself and your people. So good to know. Now, Father, as we <clears throat> look to the Word to learn, we shall preach as the Holy Spirit has freedom and liberty with the realization that we are speaking in your presence and in the presence of those who were actually present at the time these things took place. So we're very conscious of this this morning, and we look to the Holy Spirit to give us light and direction and understanding and unfold to our hearts this morning the marvel of the things which took place in this incident from thy scripture. I thank you for saving me. I thank you for keeping me. I thank you for where I am and who I am and what I am. And there isn't a thing in my life and there isn't a thing in me that I would change if I had the power. For I need everything you've allowed and everything that stands this morning in reality is a necessary factor in bringing me to know you more perfectly and to love you more fervently. Thank you that you are indeed running things. We're sorry for those who have no God. And we're sorrier for those who have such a little God that he loses control of everything and everybody. I thank you, Father, that you are God and there is none beside you. And no one needs to counsel you and no one needs to advise you and nobody needs to help you. But you're doing that which is good and perfect in your sight and according to your will, determined before the foundation of the world for your glory and for the everlasting good of those who come to know thee. I love you, Father, because you first loved me. Bless now in the preaching of thy word. Bless thyself. And then bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> This is the 16th message in a series on Simon Peter. Probably we won't have over one or two messages left yet in this series because it seems to me like the Lord's growing quieter and quieter each week on the subject of Simon Peter. Not because he has run out of things to share with us, but because perhaps he's running out of people who want to listen. So, in this message this morning, if you would like to follow in your Bible somewhat, I'm going to read from the life of Christ in stereo again, but if you would like to follow me, perhaps the account in Luke 24 would be closer to what I'm reading. Now, what I'm about to read from the life of Christ in stereo is the account of John 20, verses 19 to 23, and Luke 24, verses 36 to 43, woven together to make one continuous story of this event. 
Now this takes place on the day of the resurrection in the evening. And the story begins this way, And rising up that same hour, they returned to Jerusalem, that is, the Emmaus disciples, one of whose name was Cleopas. And I have reason to believe that the other one was quite possibly his wife, whose name was Mary, who was a sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So this is the mother of Jesus, sister and brother-in-law. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those with them assembled together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he appeared to Simon. And so they told the things that had happened on the road and how he was known by them in the breaking of the bread. But they did not believe them. But as they were speaking these things, it being therefore evening of that first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus himself came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace to you. Yet they were shocked and filled with fright, and they thought they were beholding a spirit. But he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why, and I like a better word here than doubtings, the Greek word says, Why do dialogues arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet for it is I myself. Handle me and see. Spirit doesn't have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet and his side. And then did the disciples rejoice at seeing the Lord. And while they were still disbelieving for joy, yet filled with wonder, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took and ate it before them. Jesus therefore said again to them, Peace to you. And as the Father hath sent me forth, so am I sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a precious story? Every time I read an account in the New Testament, of one of the early gatherings of the saints, I can't help but be amazed at how unlike the church business those assemblies really were. I think the first thing that marks the gathering of the early believers in the first century was the utter and complete simplicity of their gathering. They had no pretentious buildings, and uh, they met in secret. And here we find them meeting behind locked doors for fear, not of the Romans, for fear, not of the bad guys, but for fear of the good guys, for fear of the religious world, for fear of organized religion. That's what put fear on these disciples. It wasn't the Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers had no reason to bother these dear people. It was professing Christianity that struck fear in their hearts. And so because of that, they, they gathered secretly, as it were, locked all the doors, and sat down together to have fellowship in Jesus. And I believe, and I'll just throw this in, it doesn't really have anything to do with the message, but I believe that there is a dispensational picture here and a prophetic picture. Because the time that this event took place was the very end, the last days of the Jewish age. The dispensation that belonged to the Jews alone in God's dealings with man was about to close. It closed with the stoning of Stephen, and a whole new dispensation began with the calling of Saul of Tarsus and the laying of a foundation of a building that was not made with hands and could not be seen with human eye, called the church, the body of Christ. So as the Jewish age was about to close here in the last days, we find the circumstances of true believers, and now... 1900 years this side 
We are witnessing the last days, the closing of another dispensation, the Gentile dispensation, the age of grace, the church time. And as it draws to a close, I believe that more and more true believers will be found meeting in this fashion. Perhaps behind locked doors. I've been saying it for years. It's going to come to pass. Just a handful. Afraid, troubled, harassed, persecuted, hated and rejected by the religious world around them. Meeting simply behind locked doors to share in the only thing that held them together and the only thing they had in common and the only thing that was real to them and that thing was a person and that person was the Lord Jesus Christ. So now I want to talk to you about the assembly that met there that night and liken it to this assembly which meets here this morning and other assemblies wherever they meet around the world who have gathered to have fellowship in Jesus. I don't think any of us can grasp the real drama that goes on when the assembly comes together. There's an eternal drama being acted out here this morning. I believe that. None of you are here but choice. This is a divine appointment. You came with different motives, different reasons brought you here. Some of you don't even know why you came, but you're here. And that's the point. And you've been drawn to this one moment of time and to this one place in space that the Lord Jesus might do what he wants to do for you and to you and in you and through you and by you. And just as in this early assembly, which we're going to talk about in a moment, there were all different kinds of people there and there's different kinds of people here. And I trust that when the meeting's over, that the same results that took place there will have taken place here. And it's exciting. As I think of all of this internal work of the Holy Spirit going on, while we look around complacently sometimes and think, oh, hum, it's just another Sunday morning, sitting on the same old metal chairs in the same old hall, nothing's going to happen, nothing will happen. But something's happening, and something's going to happen right here this morning. I had a little thought a couple of years ago, which I developed in a message and was never able to give it again. I hope I can sometime. But it had to do with the Bible being a book of life, in that all of the lives that have ever lived, all of the lives that are being lived now, and all of the lives that will be lived in the future, have already been lived in the Bible. If you took the personal experiences in the Bible from each person's life and put them all together in one long, continuous drama of life, you would have the overall picture of every one of us who have, by faith, become the children of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's times in our lives when we're in the lion's den. There's times when we're in the fiery furnace. There's times when we look in the book and we see ourselves wandering in the wilderness, lost our direction. And then I thank the Lord there's times when we're in the land that flows with milk and honey. There's times when we're camped in peace. There's times when Amalek and all his army comes out against us. There's times when we're standing face to face with Pharaoh and challenging him with the word of God. There's times when we're driven out by our beloved brethren around us as an outcast and made to go to the backside of the desert to be alone with God. There's times when we can stand on Mount Carmel and challenge the prophets of Baal, and there's times when we sit under the juniper tree and cry and ask God to take us home because we're afraid of tomorrow. There's times when we're walking on the water, and there's times when we're sinking. Now we're coming down to our message this morning. There's times when we can declare with everything in us, He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's real to me. I know who He is. And there's times when we stand with head bowed and say, I know Him not. This is your life in this book. That's why the book is alive. That's why you can come there and find yourself there. That's why if you look long enough, you see right where you are. 
and right where you've been and right where you're going. And so just thinking over that this morning uh, in regards to this message before us, the assembly that met that Sunday night, we're meeting again this morning. Not just like them, but it's being lived over again in us and through us. The faces have changed. Geographical location is not the same. Time, as far as the calendar is concerned, is not the same. But some of us are saints of God, not because the Catholic Church said we were, but because God said we were. Some of us are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And we're gathered here in this hall this morning. And I think that some of the same motives that brought them brought some of us this morning. And so I'll leave this question with you as I try to reconstruct what I believe happened on the basis of the scripture, not on imagination, but on the basis of what I find here. And I'll leave you with this one question. Where are you in the assembly this morning? Let me just tell the story like it was a Bible story. It's Sunday toward evening. The biggest Sunday that ever took place in the history of the world. It was the first day of the week upon which God loosed his blessed son and raised him from among the dead ones and showed him to be alive by many infallible proofs to those who had known him and loved him. It's Sunday evening and the sun is just beginning to set and, and the night shadows are falling. And Jerusalem, as a city, a very large city, is beginning to quiet down for the night. The activity in the streets have begun to cease. But here and there is a lone individual scurrying, as it were, to this little room. I don't know where this room was. There's no reason to doubt. It may well have been the same upper room where they ate the last Passover. For this room had been specially prepared, apparently by John Mark's mother and father, by the good man of the house who had made available a place for them to meet and to share together. So there's no reason to doubt that it may have been that very same upper room in Jerusalem where they had first met for the Passover where Jesus spoke those wonderful, wonderful things and washed the disciples' feet, and perhaps the same upper room where later they would meet and witness the miracle of Pentecost. But here and there a lone figure scurries through the lengthening shadows, climbing rapidly now the outside wall and seeking admittance into this upper room or large loft which had been specially prepared for them. The news had spread among them, like in the underground, that some tremendous things had happened and were happening now and was about to happen. They had heard the report of Mary Magdalene. She had said, He's risen. And he said for me to tell all of you that he is ascending and has ascended to his Father and to his God and to our Father and to our God. And he said to tell all of you that he's going to go before you into Galilee and that you may rest assured you will see him. So they'd heard the report of Mary Magdalene and if it had been modern times I would have said that Mary Magdalene had been on the telephone all day and she'd been calling all the saints and saying, come to the meeting tonight. I've seen Jesus and he, oh, he's got some wonderful things to share with us. You better be there tonight. And also, I'm sure that they had heard from John, because you remember John went to the tomb early in the morning, and he went in and saw with understanding. He understood the meaning of it somehow or another, and he believed what he had seen. And I'm sure that John wasn't uh, uh, quiet all day either, that he was spreading the word wherever he went. I went to the tomb, and this is what I saw, and this is what I understand. Be at the meeting tonight. There's going to be a meeting tonight. As soon as the sun goes down, be in the upper room. Let's all get together and share together what we've learned about Jesus. Here they come. And lo and behold, some of the women have shown up with broiled fish. Others brought a honeycomb. 
but they brought something to eat. They brought it all together because I think they anticipated being there a long time. And so as they gathered there in the, in the upper room, let's imagine for just a moment that we are there because indeed we are. And let us look around at the faces of those who are there. Who are they? A portion of this group of people are simply called the Eleven. Now that doesn't exactly mean Eleven numerically, but that is a term like uh, you'd refer to the uh, to the five thousand or to the 120, there weren't exactly 11 there, as I will show you in a moment, but the 11 was a corporate term applied to the original disciples, who had once been called the 12. But now, Judas has been eliminated from their roster, and now they're simply known as the 11 from this point on. So, here is one group of people called the 11, and then there's another group of people here that are called them that were with them, companions of the eleven, brethren and sisters of the eleven, more saints of God, those who were disciples of the Lord Jesus and had been with the original twelve. And I know for a fact, as I look back here in the historical record, that some of these very people sitting there in the assembly had just a few hours before forsaken the Lord and fled from his presence. He had taken them to a place where they chose not to go, and that was Calvary. He had gone to a place where they would not follow him. And you remember, it says, All forsook him in the Garden of Gethsemane and fled. When the women first went to the tomb on Sunday morning, they came to these, some of these same people, and they were described in Mark's gospel as those who mourned and those who wept. Not very happy people. And they were described by Luke as those who were troubled and those who had thoughts arising in their hearts, and the Greek says, who had been engaged in great dialogue in their hearts. Now, you know, a dialogue is a conversation or an exchange between two persons. And they had been engaged in deep dialogue down inside. Did you ever have a dialogue inside of you going on? Where it seemed like one person was saying one thing and another person was saying something else, and you were just kind of like a bystander wondering who was going to win? Many of these people, troubled, weeping people, sorrowful people, shamed people, for they had forsaken the Lord and they had fled. Some of these people were engaged in deep internal conflict, down inside where a raging battle seemed to be going on, a dialogue that wouldn't cease. A part of them was saying, he's dead and he never will be back again, and another part of them was saying, but he's risen and he will be back again. A part of them was saying, I believe. Another part was saying, Lord, help my unbelief. A part of them was saying, you can't deny what you see and you can't deny the facts. This is reality. And another part of them was saying, yes, but this is reality for the moment. That reality may change in the next moment. So there were some people that were pretty well stirred up down inside with internal conflict. And this internal conflict had to do with the circumstances of their life at that very moment. But they came, thank the Lord, they came. And as you will see, Jesus knew about it, and he did something about it. They were like bewildered, frightened, and frustrated sheep. Listen carefully. Where are you in this group? You were people who had lost all touched with Jesus. People in whose life at the moment they experienced no reality of the Lord Jesus in their life. People who had not only lost their touch with Jesus, but people who had lost their place in life. 
the circumstances of their lives in the last three days and nights had suddenly spelled out one word, and that word was confusion, frustration, bewilderment, and following that fear, inner conflict, trouble upon their souls. Where do we go from here? Where have we been? What's going on? I can't figure out what the Lord is doing. I can't figure out why he has allowed these things. I don't know what he expects of me. But still they came, and they came to the assembly, men and women who expected nothing from Jesus and who deserved nothing from Jesus, but people who were needy. And so they needed to be there because they were needy people. And I'll tell you what they needed. They needed to see him. They needed to hear him. And above all, as we learn in our story, they needed to touch him. And I throw this out because I think this may be what brought some of them there, realizing who they were and where they were and what was going on inside of them, and perhaps even knowing what they needed. Maybe they didn't really come expecting to see him and hear him and touch him, but they came because they knew there would be some there who had seen him and heard him and touched him, and perhaps they could touch him through those who had touched him. And perhaps those who had touched him would touch them. And so, in effect, the same end. Jesus would touch them, and they would touch him. That's a necessary part of the fellowship of the saints. You need the fellowship of the saints. And I need the fellowship of the saints. There's times when Jesus is not real to me, when I've lost my touch with him, and I've lost the sense of his touch on me. And all oh, many times I've been touched again by being with those who have touched him, and seeing the reality in their lives, and seeing it in their face. Many times the greatest touch of Jesus' hand on my heart in this assembly has been before I've ever opened the word to preach. It came through the touch of your hand, or the sound of your voice, or the sight of your face. That's why I'm anxious to be here every Sunday morning. Well, let's discuss like they might have discussed that Sunday night. We've talked a little bit about some of the people who were there. Let's talk about the people who aren't there, because we're always talking about those who are absent. And I'm sure that some of them must have looked around as soon as they came in the hall and said, Boy, there's not a very big crowd here tonight. Huh, wonder who's gone. And they started looking around. I'm just imagining that maybe this conversation went on. They were real people, weren't they? And somebody looked around and said, Where's uh, Brother Thomas? But he seen him? Andrew, you seen him? No, I haven't seen Thomas all day. How about you, Matthew? Have you seen him? No, no, I haven't seen Thomas since that night in Gethsemane. Somebody says, well, I saw him Saturday. Boy, he was in a bad place. He said he didn't think he'd ever come back to assembly again. He said he had had it with the assembly. He said, I don't think I'll ever come back anymore because Jesus isn't real to me and he's not real to any of them people down there and no use me coming back. Let me just throw this in in case that happens to be your attitude some Sunday morning. It was sure Thomas's loss. It was sure Thomas's loss because those who did show up saw Jesus and they touched him and they heard him. And they entered into new peace and new joy that they'd never known before. And they went out telling others, we saw him. He was with us that night. Thomas lost out. They didn't lose anything, but he sure did. And somebody might have said that. They might have said, well, if he don't show up tonight, it's, it'll be his loss. He's where he wants to be. And he was. And then somebody looked around and they said, well, where's Cleopas and Mary? I thought, sure, they'd be here tonight. And somebody said, oh... 
They went back to Mass. That's where they live, you know, and they... Boy, they were in a bad way the last time I saw them, too. My, oh, my, they were gloomy. Boy, they were miserable. And they were arguing with each other and disputing the things that had taken place. And last I saw them, they were headed out of Jerusalem on I-77, and they were trying to analyze all the things that had happened, and they were just fussing and fuming and miserable and sad and wretched. Tell you the truth, I'm kind of glad it didn't show up the assembly night. It might have put an awful cold, wet blanket on all of us. But Jesus will take care of them. And then somebody said, well, Simon Peter's not here. And I'm wondering if somebody might have said, well, why should he be? And somebody else might have said, well, I, for one, hope he don't show up. Because I don't think I can even be friendly to the guy if he comes after what he's done. And somebody else might have said, hey, Simon Peter will never be back. After what he did that night in the judgment hall, he'll never have the courage to show up here. This is one place he won't be. Probably down at the fireside with his friends, like he was the night the Lord was delivered to the hand of Pilate. Probably out on the town tonight. Well, we're not going to wait on Simon Peter. We're just going to go ahead and uh, start the meeting. Then somebody began to talk about how troubled and afraid they were. And soon they began to confess their mutual fear. And soon somebody said, <clears throat> let's lock the doors. I'd feel safer and I'd feel more comfortable if somebody would just bar the doors. So nobody else could get in. We could control who would come into this meeting hall. Oh, I tell you, there's many times I wish that there was a bar on that door. And I'll have to be honest with you. Some I would keep out if I were controlling the meeting. And some I'd go out and bring in if I could. And they were afraid that someone would come in and spoil their time of fellowship with Jesus. Someone would come in make trouble for them, religious trouble, not any other kind. And so I, I think they sit and discuss this, and, and this tells me something precious about this early assembly. There was reality among these brethren. And when I say reality, I mean they were real with each other. What a blessed assembly it was where a man could be afraid and troubled and filled with inner conflict and not be ashamed to admit it openly among his brothers and sisters. <clears throat> and know that they wouldn't laugh at him or make fun of him for being unspiritual, but might even do something to help him by locking the door if it make him feel better. We don't have any reality like that much in the religious world today. People go to church, and they come to Christian meetings, and they come with an air of victory, and they come confessing all of their triumphs, but very few people have ever known such fellowship where they had the liberty to come and confess their defeats, their sins, their failures, and their faults. Very few people have ever known the joy of such fellowship where they could be real with one another and know that the mantle of love would be cast upon them and they would be loved because of Jesus in them. Not, mind you, Loving Jesus in them and ignoring the man, but loving the man because they know that Jesus loves him and because Jesus loves him through them. So here they came in their mutual fear, but absolutely dead honest and real with each other. They had to have confessed this openly or there would have been no reason to lock the door. Somebody had to confess their fear. And apparently they all mutually agreed that they'd feel better if the doors were locked. And so they went back and they locked the doors. Now nobody else will get in. But they did. <clears throat> Tell you, first of all, who got in? Here they are sitting there talking. You can just feel the, <clears throat> the tension in this room. Bits and pieces of testimony are being given. Mary Magdalene perhaps said her thing. 
And maybe John had something to say, and others added a word here and there, and the women that had brought the spices to embalm him told what they had seen. And now suddenly they hear the footsteps. And they're coming up the outside stairway. And they're coming closer and closer and closer, and if these men were afraid to start with, they must be terrified by now. <clears throat> Wondering who it is that perhaps is going to beat the door down at any moment and drag them away like they had taken the Lord in Gethsemane. Or whatever it was they were afraid of happening was about to happen. And then there's a tap on the door, and someone goes to the door and turns around excitedly and says, It's Cleopas and Mary. And they're dusty, and they're tired. And here they are. They've come all the way back from Emmaus. The door opens, and in comes Cleopas and Mary. But the dust is not what they pay attention to, and, and the weariness in their face is not what they pay attention to. It's something else in their face, because these people have spiritual heartburn. Their hearts are on fire, burning within them. And I, oh, I just, I can see these people babbling almost incoherently, Cleopas trying to tell it, Mary interrupting. Mary trying to say something, Cleopas saying, no, wasn't that way, let me tell it. And the both of them just throwing bits and pieces in, and maybe somebody saying, like Brother John, wait a minute, hold it, hold it, hold it, start at the beginning, back up. Now tell us exactly what happened. Well, here's what we want to tell you. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. And listen, brothers, he hath already appeared to Simon. Now, this tells me that Simon wasn't there, because had he been there, they would have had no need to make that announcement. And I'm almost sure that Simon wasn't there, but was present later due to the fact that when John begins to tell who was there and who wasn't, he says only one of the eleven was not present, and his name was Thomas. But I believe that Peter was late getting to the meeting. I'll tell you why I think he was late getting there. He arrives after Cleopas and Mary. Cleopas and Mary come in after the doors are locked, and they make the announcement, He's risen. He's risen. He has appeared to Simon. And I couldn't help but take note of the fact that they were not as kind to him as the angels were, because when the angels spoke to the women, he said, Go tell his disciples and Peter. And let me remind you, brethren, that when you come to the assembly, probably there will be those who will always see the Simon in you. Even though they'll rejoice that the Lord has appeared to you, they'll still remember that you're Simon. But you remember that when you come to the assembly, the angels never see anybody but Peter. And so they said, the Lord is risen, and he's appeared to Simon. And before they could get much more out, Methinks, I hear another sound of footsteps on the stairs, but these footsteps aren't coming as quickly and as rapidly as the footprints, uh, the footsteps of, of Mary and Cleopas, but they're coming anyway. And somebody goes to the door and opens it just a crack and turns around and utters a word that brings silence on the whole group. It's Simon Peter. Simon Peter. Simon Peter's coming to the assembly. He's out there at the door. What do we do? And I hear John saying, for crying out loud, what do you mean, what do you do? Let him in. What's the matter with you? Huh? Let him in. So the door opens, and can't you see the, the thing that's happening there? Can't you see it in your mind's eye? And they're all looking around at each other, and I have an idea that every one of those people in the assembly were remembering all the things they'd said about Simon since three days and nights before. And I have an idea that when they see his face, when he walks in the door, they recall every word of criticism they had passed on him in the previous days. So here comes Simon Peter. He's late, but he's there. I think he was late because he was reluctant to come. He wanted to come. He needed to come. They needed him to come. 
Jesus bid him come. He had to come, but I think he came reluctantly, just as he came reluctantly to the judgment hall that night, and just as he came reluctantly to the tomb, now he comes reluctantly to the assembly. Is his reluctance due to his shame in the presence of Jesus? No. He comes there expecting to meet the saints. And his reluctance stems from a concern about how he will be received by them. He knows how he stands with Jesus. Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he knows how he stands with himself. Now, it's another matter when you have to walk out in the street and find out how you stand with others. That's why he was reluctant. And I can hear Simon Peter's dialogue down inside of him as he trudges along the back streets of Jerusalem with sweaty palms, saying, what will they say? What will they think? Will they let me in? Will they beat me? Will they spit on me when I come to the door? Will they tell me that they never want to see my face again? And if they do, will it be enough that Jesus loves me and he knows that I love him? Yes, it'll be enough. Oh, he wasn't going to, to get approved by the assembly. Neither was he going to be accepted by the assembly. He was going because he wanted to be there, and he needed to be there, and Jesus had bid him be there. And so he comes, and they let him in, and every eye in the room is fixed on him. And you know, one of the interesting things to me is I don't think the assembly realized that night how badly they needed Simon Peter to show up. Do you know why they needed him to be there that night? First of all, they needed him to sift their hearts like his heart had been sifted. Because I tell you, his presence in that hall sifted them. How do you say it sifted them? Why? Very simply. It brought to the forefront immediately all of the criticism that they had made of him in private. All of the condemnation they had passed upon him in private, and all of the judgment they had meted out in private upon Simon Peter. He needed to be there to put to the test of reality all of the doctrine that they had said they believed and preached among themselves about loving one another as Jesus had loved them. And let me tell you something. When a man like Simon Peter walks in the hall, and we all know full well his history, and his sins have been open and, pu and public, and his shame and his disgrace has been the topic of conversation in the whole town, when a man like that walks in your assembly, that's where the rubber meets the road about this thing called Christian love. Because then our hearts are sifted, and we find out that if the love of Jesus isn't real to us, we can't conjure anything up. You can't manufacture that kind of love. Yet he said, love you one another, as I have loved you. How did he love you when you were ungodly, unworthy, a sinner, defiled, unclean, wretched, blind, miserable, poor, dead in your trespasses and sins, when not only all your past but all your future was one big blot before him. He loved you in spite of who you were, in spite of who you are, and in spite of what he knew you would be, he loved you freely and commends that kind of love to you as being the only kind of love we will ever know that's real. So Simon Peter needed to be there, because <laughs> let me tell you, he put every saint in that hall at high noon when he walked in the door. 
I see what's happening among the saints as he walks in. I see one brother drop his head and he can't meet the eyes of Simon Peter. Why? Why, because just a few hours before he'd been talking to another brother about Simon Peter and he had said such little things as, hey, that guy had more light than the rest of us. He goes out and does a thing like that to heck with him. Or he'd been saying such things like, I couldn't believe that he was capable of doing such a thing as that. I don't ever want to see him again, and I don't want to have anything to do with him. And I'll tell you one thing. He better never show up at the assembly again, because if he does, I'll give him a piece of my mind. And the people who are always giving somebody a piece of their mind never can spare it. <laughs> and I see another saint of God, and he has to drop his head too. Because he's sitting there thinking about all the things he'd felt in his heart towards Simon Peter. The bitterness and the resentment. And believe me, the hatred. What will he do now? Will he get up and leave the meeting because he can't stand to be in the very presence of this man? What's he going to do about this poor fallen brother who has dared to walk in the hall and present himself to his brothers and sisters? You know how Simon Peter had the courage to do it? And now he continued to do it week after week after week after week. He knew that Jesus loved him. And he knew that he loved Jesus. And if the saints could live with that, fine. And if they couldn't, it was all right with him. He knew who he was and he knew who Jesus was. And that was very real to him. And that's what brought him to the assembly. But I see that they're not all just rushing up to greet him. You see at the door and shake his hand and kiss him and tell him how glad they are to see him. But oh, they needed him there to try him and to test him and to sift. What I'm sure was discovered to be in many of them the phoniness and the hypocrisy of their professed love. And then too, they didn't realize it, but they needed this man to strengthen them he had some things he could tell them that would be meaningful. He had been through some experiences that they needed to know about. He wrote them later in his epistle. If had they given him opportunity that night, he could have said such things as, Oh, my brothers, I warn you against Satan who roams to and fro, back and forth across the face of this earth like a raging, roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I warn you, brothers, if you ever come to a place in your life where you think you're standing, take heed or you'll fall like I did. And I hear him say things like, Oh, let us not love one another with a feigned love, but let us love one another fervently, fervently, as Jesus loved us. And I hear him, maybe he could have said something like this, I would never have known the strength of the Lord Jesus had it not been for the revealing of my weakness. And let me tell you something, brothers. They needed this man as a testimony to the unfailing promise of the Lord Jesus and the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus in not letting the faith of this man fail. Here was a man sitting there among them. The very fact that he was alive and not a suicide like Judas Iscariot was evidence of the fact that he could still believe and he was still standing, not because of anything he was and not because of anything he did, but because of the faithful ministry of the Lord Jesus to him. I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. What is faith? in this regard. And how can I say that his faith didn't fail? His courage failed. His boldness failed. His promises failed. Peter's, that is. His religion failed. His works failed. Everything about him failed, but his faith didn't fail. Because the very essence of faith, set in this context, is dependence, total, utter dependence upon another. A total distrust of myself. And the deep, desperate need of someone's strength besides mine. And someone's faithfulness besides mine. And someone's performance besides mine. 
that faith had never failed in this man. As never before he believed that he must now totally depend upon the Lord Jesus, that there was no good thing in him, that in his weakness he could only hope for the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you, I thank God for that early assembly. But they let him in, <laughs> and that they let him stay. And unknown to them, a work was going on in their hearts by the Lord Jesus the second he walked in the door. A strengthening work, a convicting work. So many things were taking place there, all being done by Jesus. Simon Peter needed to be there for his sake. He needed to be there for their sake. And I say this, that in that assembly and in this assembly right here, I see a great testimony to the reality of the love of the Lord Jesus. Let me put it to you this way. Where else in this world, what society on the earth, what group of human beings any place could have tolerated Simon Peter excepting men and women who had been with Jesus? Nobody. I see it happening here. Isn't it interesting? They didn't make him make any confessions at the door. They didn't discipline him. They didn't get the rule book out and say, You broke rule 13, section B. You'll have to meet with the deacons after the meeting tonight to see what they're going to do with you. Isn't it strange that the, that the preacher didn't bring him up on the platform and rebuke him openly for his public sin? And uh, tell him that he would have to ask forgiveness from the saints before they could let him back into the Lord's table and into the fellowship of the church. Isn't it strange that nobody rebuked him and nobody asked for a confession? Nobody put him down and nobody put him out. And you better not be doing that in any assembly where Jesus' people meet. Because I'll tell you why. When Jesus invites a man to come, you better not hinder him. You better let him come. Because it just ain't any of your business who shows up. It's his and his alone. And he sent angels all the way from heaven to tell him to come. He said, you go tell my disciples, but you tell Peter too, because I want him there. When Jesus goes out here in the streets of Parkersburg or Belfry or Marietta or Williamstown or any place else in this locality, and he says, you come to the assembly, I want him there, and I want you there. Oh, far be it from me, far be it from me to ask for any public confessions or any restitution to be made or any apologies. Who are we, little tin gods? who dare to call the saints before us to give an accounting for their lives, to his master he stands or he falls. And my brothers, let me tell you this. Which one among us is fit to cast the first stone? Which one of us have walked in his shoes? Which one of us have known the pressures, the burden, the mixed up emotions inside, all of those factors together that made him fall? And which one of us is fit to say, though he did, I never shall? Brothers and sisters, we are fit to do but one thing. If we have any spirituality at all, we are fit to restore such an one in a spirit of meekness, taking heed unto ourselves, lest we also be tempted, and to take warning from this thing we have witnessed in the life of others. For if we sow condemnation in the life of that fallen brother, if we sow judgment in the life of that fallen brother, fallen in our eyes, if we sow criticism, and damnation upon that brother who has disgraced himself in our eyes, 
we may be asking to reap a harvest of the very same thing in our own lives. God is not mocked in whatever a man sows, he shall also reap. Better to be meek, my brethren, and quiet in the presence of a fallen brother. His business is between him and Jesus. And Jesus has dealt with him before he ever got to the assembly or he wouldn't be here. Jesus bid him come. And outside of that, he wouldn't have had the courage to come. And I think that Simon Peter walking in that upper room that night without a word was one of the greatest experiences of personal faith in the Lord Jesus in the New Testament. You think about that. That took a lot of, you know what? Intestinal fortitude. And do you know where he got that intestinal fortitude? Before he ever tapped on that door and before he ever dared to open the portal, he had been with Jesus. And Jesus was said, had said it was all right. And Peter knew it was all right, and he didn't a whole lot care whether it was all right with the rest of them or not. <laughs> right? So he showed up. I just wanted to give a little hand to Simon Peter. Man who knows who he is and who Jesus is in his life. So here he is. Well, this is all over, and Cleopas and Mary start babbling again. Well, we haven't told you all of it. I told you the Lord has arisen and he appeared to Simon. And now Simon's told you a little bit perhaps what's happened. But we have something else to tell you. We want to tell you the things that were done in the way. And we want to tell you how he was made known to us in the breaking of the bread. And they're recounting their story. We came on down to Emmaus and we asked Jesus to come in and spend the night with us. We told him it was getting late. We said, abide with us, Lord, a day is far spent. And so he came into our home, and we set bread out on the table and wine. And while we were sitting there, he picked up the bread and he broke it. And we saw the wounds in his hands. And we knew him. And suddenly our eyes were opened. And here this stranger that had walked with us all the way down the road, and we were ignorant of his presence. Lo and behold, it was Jesus all the time. And oh, it was so wonderful. And, and Mary would look at Cleopas, and Cleopas would look at Mary, and one of them would say, Oh, didn't our hearts burn while he talked to us? And me without a tongue. <laughs> didn't our hearts burn when he opened the Scriptures to us? And here they are expounding all these things, and the Scripture says, Listen to me, brethren. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself, appeared in the midst, and he said, Peace, be not afraid, it is I myself. And all two things I want to pass on to you. One is that I would to God I could speak like that. And I would to God for every one of you who know, Lord, that when you speak about Jesus, that you could speak out of such a deep personal relationship with him, out of such recent personal experience of fellowship with him that as you spoke your burning heart was evident in your face and in your words and that you could speak in such a way that the reality of Jesus would suddenly be a reality to those with whom you speak. For as they thus spake, the unreal Jesus, real to Cleopas and Mary, real to Simon Peter, real to John and real to Mary Magdalene, and no doubt real to others there, but the unreal Jesus to those who were weeping and mourning and depressed and troubled and still in the midst of great dialogue and internal conflict, terrified men behind locked doors who had lost their place in life and lost their touch with Jesus, the same Jesus was made real to them too. Oh, I would to God that every time I spoke, that would be the effect. That the reality of Jesus in my experience would somehow rub off and come through and spill out on others until he became real.
to them. I myself, he said. I want to close this message talking about Jesus. So I want to tell you what he did there that night and how he did it. First of all, the thing they learned right off was that he really was real. We'll wear that word out before we get done with this series. He was made real to them suddenly. And the miracle of it all, and this is why they were terrified, was that he had not only suddenly made himself real, he had been real all the time and they didn't know it. He was with them right there in that assembly, right there in that hall. He is with us right here in this hall this morning. How many of you know it? <clears throat> and a greater miracle than that, he has been with us every step of the way since we last sat here in these hard chairs. He followed you all the way to Emmaus this week and ate your dust all the way down there, seven miles down and seven miles back, and talked to you in your heart, and you didn't even know who it was talking to you. You thought it was some stranger, and you didn't hear a word he said. You could have been comforted all week long. He stood beside you, brother and sister, when you went fishing this week and said, to heck with it. And you threw yourselves into the lawful pursuits of life and into the business of life, and you said, I'm not going to think about Jesus anymore, I'm not going to think about the assembly, and forget all these things. He was right there with you, keeping the fish out of your net, or filling your net up, whatever the case has been this week. Jesus walked with you every step of the road. He sat with you in your car while you went to work yesterday morning. He was with you in your home. He heard everything you said. He witnessed everything you did. He was the silent observer and the silent listener at every conversation at your dinner table this week. He was the last to kiss you goodnight and the last to wrap his arms around you before you drifted off to sleep. He was the one that stood guard over you while you slept, oblivious that he was even alive. He's the one that wakened you again for every time you wake in the morning. It is as much a resurrection from the dead as his was. Yes, he was real. He had been real all the time. And he had been with them all the time in spite of their fears, in spite of their troubles, in spite of the dialogue that they needlessly engaged in down inside all week long, and in spite of their unbelief, and in spite of their objections, and in spite of their petty bickering among themselves, their criticism of one another, their condemnation of fallen saints, and all of the other stuff that had made up their unspiritual lives for days and days. He was with them in spite of all of it, just waiting for them to look at him, waiting for them to see him again. He suddenly appeared to them. Now, I didn't tell you, you noticed, that they heard another set of footsteps on the stairs and a tap at the door, and they went to the door, and it was Jesus. That isn't what the Scripture even intimates. It speaks of him always being there, but suddenly becoming visible to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened as the Emmaus disciples' eyes were opened, and they saw not that he had arrived, that he had always been there. He had heard all of the discussion about Simon Peter. He had heard it all about Cleopas and Mary. He had heard all the remarks of John and Mary Magdalene and everybody else. And he had even taken notice of the fact that some of the good women of the church had brought broiled fish and a honeycomb. He knew every little thing about that assembly, and he also knew why every person was there and just exactly what they needed before they left there. Jesus wants to be real to you. He says, I myself see it is I myself. And then these gracious words, handle me and see. He wants to be real to you. He's willing for you to touch him. And if you came here this morning and he's unreal to you, if you came here and you've lost your touch with Jesus, listen, touch 
is connected in my mind with feelings. He lets you touch him so you can feel like you once felt, if that's what it takes. Jesus loves you. He wants to be real to you. He's saying now, here I am, I'm here myself, reach out and touch me, reach out. But it takes a hand of faith that will reach out and say, Lord, I know you're real to Simon Peter, and I know you're real to John, and I know you're real to Mary Magdalene, and I certainly know you're real to Cleopas and Mary, and I want you to be real to me. This is what Thomas went through at the next assembly meeting on the next Sunday night, but it was happening right there too a week before. This happening right here. You said Jesus wasn't real to you this week. You said it to yourself or you said it to somebody else. He'll be real to you. Reach out and handle him. Reach out and touch him. He's here. He loves you. You wasted a whole week kicking Simon Peter around. Don't waste another day. You wasted a whole week bad-mouthing somebody else or condemning somebody else. Don't do it anymore. Reach out and touch Jesus. You wasted a whole week trying to solve the problems of life and analyzing and scrutinizing and investigating like the Emmaus disciples trying to put all the pieces together and come up with a formula for success. Forget it. Here is success. It's Jesus. Reach out and touch him. Oh, there isn't anything else that matters in life but that. He wants to be real to you. He says, touch me, handle me. And then you'll feel if that's what it takes. And then when they showed this hesitancy, this drawing back, he said, come closer and look. And he held out his hands and he uncovered his side. Behold my hands. And my side, this is all we need to make Jesus real. Listen, he was wounded. That's why he showed him these places. He was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement of your peace was upon him. Whatever it is that's troubling you, you don't need to be troubled anymore. He's made peace for you. Look at the stripes on his back. Whatever it is that's upset you, whatever it is that's tearing you up inside, whatever it is that makes you so that you can't rest, look at those hands. Look at that side and tell me what's to worry about. What's to worry about? Jesus has already died for you, gone to hell for you, borne every stripe that awaits you, solved every problem for you, answered every question, cleared up the past, and secured the future. The present can now be a blessed reality and a joy if you just reach out there and touch him and say, Lord, you're there, and you died for me, and your Father has justified me, and nothing can be laid to my charge. It's me and you, Lord. It's me and you. It says that the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Not when they saw his physical appearance, but when they saw his wounds. That's the only place you can find any joy. That's the only place you can find any peace. And then I like this little insignificant thing that happened here. After he did this, he looked around and he could see that that wasn't quite enough yet. And so he said, do you uh, have anything to eat here? Somebody said, well, Lord, we just got some broiled fish and honeycomb. If we'd known you were coming, we'd make the cake. It was just broiled fish and honeycomb. Oh, that's fine. Is that what you were going to eat? Yeah, that's what I'll eat. Isn't he gracious? Let me have a little bit. So they brought him a broiled fish and they brought him a little bit of honeycomb. And lo and behold, the scripture says he ate it right there before them. Sat there and ate it. I don't know what it does to you, but I'll tell you what it does to me. It tells me Jesus is interested in the little ordinary mundane things in my life. When I sit down and eat a hot dog with onions, he sits down there and he'll partake the same thing with me. I'm not trying to be irreligious or sacrilegious. 
I'm telling you that Jesus can be as real to you as you sit at McDonald's eating a hamburger, as he was real to them sitting in the upper room eating broiled fish and eating honeycomb. And if that isn't so, who cares about Christianity? Just a bunch of moldy doctrines that worked for somebody 2,000 years ago. He's got to be real now, people, or you ain't got anything. Have you? No. People want doctrine? Come to my office. I've got about three crates of doctrinal books I'd like to give to somebody. I'll give you a whole crate of them, a whole skid of them. You can take them home and pour over the musty pages the rest of your life. I wouldn't trade one moment of Jesus being real in my life where I am for all the doctrine my head ever absorbed and all the theology that's ever been put on paper and all the pompous, pious whatevers that have been preached from the pulpits of the land. Jesus has got to be where I am, eating what I eat, walking where I walk, living like I live because I need him where I am to make it through the night. I can't get to where he is. He at the moment has to come where I am. And one day I'll be where he has always been, the place he prayed for. Oh, that they may be one with thee as I am one, and that they may be where I am now. The last word is this. <clears throat> the next to the last word. The next to the last word is this. After these things, he opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. This was not Bible study. The things that they had read in the Scriptures and the things that they had heard in the Scriptures and the things they had known from the Scriptures for a long, long time suddenly became very real and very true to them. They suddenly understood. And you know the word in the Greek means when it says, they then opened he their understanding, the word open means thoroughly, as a firstborn opens the womb. And a better word for it, one translator says, means to disentangle. And as I think about that, there's some beautiful pictures there. Here is a baby. It's in his mother's womb. It is all entangled. Is it not? Why, here it is in a whole strange, confusing, frustrating world of darkness. But suddenly the moment of birth comes and the baby opens the womb and becomes disentangled, enters into a whole new realm where he sees what he could never see before, hears what he could never hear before, feels what he could never feel before and lives what he could never live before. And Jesus did something for these blessed people. He disentangled them spiritually. He set them free. He turned them loose. One translator trying to tell the story of what happened here, he said, he put their hearts back together again. <laughs> they were all entangled in questions. I'll tell you what had entangled them. They were all entangled over the affairs of life. They couldn't make heads or tails out of it. They had lost their place. They were confused and frightened and frustrated people who couldn't make the pieces fit, couldn't get it all together. Oh, you touched Jesus by faith. Look again at his wounds and remember what he did for you. Let him be real to you. Let him sit down with broiled fish in a honeycomb and take his place in your life. Let him show himself to you, and soon he'll disentangle you, and the pieces will begin to fit, because as he disentangled them, he assured them that everything that had been done, much to their amazement, had been done according to the word and the will of God. And that was enough. And the last word is this. Peace, peace be unto you. Oh, I tell you, peace is wonderful, isn't it? 
I was riding my bike the other day, and I was sailing along the highway, meditating on a verse of Scripture. And the verse I couldn't understand. It was a verse that said, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And it was so hard for me to accept because the only interpretation I'd ever heard of this verse of Scripture, and the one that I had accepted up to yesterday or the day before, and what had always seemed so simple to me was that confusion and peace cannot exist side by side. If there is confusion, then there cannot be peace, and if there is peace, there will be no confusion. And I just said to Jesus, he was with me on the motorcycle, you see, because he better be. I saw a guy turn his upside down last night and it exploded and caught fire. But he was with me on the motorcycle. And as we were driving along, I said, Lord, I don't understand this verse because there seems to be confusion in my life and confusion in my heart and confusion in my thoughts. And yet I have some peace, too, and I don't understand it. What's wrong with the verse? He said, there's nothing wrong with the verse. Here's what it means. You can have peace in the midst of your confusion. The confusion only exists in your heart. There isn't any confusion anyplace else. You can have peace right in the midst of your confusion. You can have cosmos in the midst of your chaos. Your circumstances may not change a bit, but you can be changed. And the only way this can happen is for you to be occupied with me in your heart. Look to me instead of your circumstances. Instead of analyzing your problems, why don't you try learning of me? I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. And if you can lay down and rest in peace in the midst of confusion, he said to me, this is the greatest testimony on earth to the grace of God that any man's life can ever give. So what is it when a bird sings in the sunshine? It is nothing's bill. But what is it when a bird sings in the rain? What is it when a man sits down and looks about him and, and, and uh, his wife and children are happily gathered around him, his bills are all paid, he's in perfect health, he's starting a three weeks vacation, got a thousand dollars in his pocket and he's going to the golf course the next morning. What is that when he sits there and says, oh, praise the Lord, have peace, have peace. It's nothing's bill. I'll tell you what it is that something's bill. It's when a man sits down in the bowels of a jail with chains on his hands and his feet and his back bloody and raw and expecting to die when the sun rises in the morning, forsaken of friends, ignored by family, hated and despised and outcast and a stranger to the very people he loves. It's somethingsville when that man can sing praises at midnight and thank God with peace. Right? When the assembly was finished, their circumstances hadn't changed a bit. In fact, they were about to be plunged into a rerun of the same old circumstances because just a short time after this assembly, he disappeared on them again. And they were made to walk totally in the dark by faith. Their circumstances hadn't changed a bit, but they had been changed by touching him, by being in his presence, by seeing his wounds again, by having their hearts disentangled by Jesus, by being brought back to the reality of who he is and what he is and what he wants to be to you. They came away with something that's priceless. It's called peace. I trust you have it. The Lord bless you.